Now let's talk for a minute about the sword itself, the way it's built, made. The Japanese did not really have steel iron reserves on their islands, so they smelted their steel, tamahogany, out of tatara sand, black sand, in the riverbeds which bore iron. And they would smelt this sand in a tatara, the traditional oven, to make tamahogany and make the steel they used for the Japanese sword. And it was very impure and it would be high carbon and low carbon and they would take and break it into little pieces according to carbon content, stack it together, put it in flames, get it all real hot until it got homogeneous, hammer it all together, fold it, and this would be, result in the beautiful thing we call hara, you know, Japanese sword. Well, tamahagi today is only used for art. We have pure steel today, we don't have to do that. And another thing the Japanese did is something called differential hardening. With differential hardening, the Japanese were able to take their tamahagini steel and make a sword that would bend rather than break, yet still be able to keep a, an edge. There's a trade-off in steel. If it's hard, it's brittle. And if it's soft, it won't hold a very good edge. Well, the Japanese found a way of doing this called differential hardening, I've already mentioned. And they would actually clay the spine of the blade with a mixture of clay and other ingredients. And actually the Japanese sword would start off either slightly curved or straight or even reverse curved when they did this and apply this to the spine. And maybe a thin layer on the ha on the and what this would do, you get it very hot again. And plunge it into water for a quench. And this will cause the edge to harden much faster, to cool much faster than the spine of the blade because of the clay. And that will cause the curve in the sword. And as well, it results in different microcrystalline structures within the steel. Where it hardened faster along the edge, you have martensite crystals, martensitic crystals in the steel, which are tightly packed, very hard crystalline structures. On the back where the clay was applied, you get perlite, which is a softer steel structure, which is much more supple. So this is how the Japanese, this is the trade-off the Japanese used to make a sword, which can be very sharp, hard on the edge and very sharp, yet not brittle and supple and soft. And again, their natural resources, which they had to make tamahogany, kind of dictated the way they made swords. Now, that differential hardening and the different crystals in the steel create what's called the Haman, which literally means edge sign or edge signature. Ha means edge or blade. Mon means it's a family crest in Japan like signature or sign. So this is a custom katana from a South African smith, James Raw, and it's made out of EM45 steel. It is differentially hardened and water quenched and resulting in a real Haman. However, it is heavily etched because the M45 does not show a good hamon. So you can see here that is the appearance of a natural. Vedetched hamon. That is the appearance of a natural vedetched hamon. This is a production katana made in China. It's a Kinsey. And now defunct brand, Kayamaro. This has a natural Hamon, but it has not been brought out by etch or polish. It's just a natural Hamon. You can see, you can't hardly see, if at all, the Hamon on here. It's just slightly a different color steel. That's what that is. Now, the way you can tell a fake Hamon usually from a real one, is hold up to the light, like so. And right there, where the hardness of the steel transfers from the martensite crystals to the, the perlite, you'll have what's called the habuki, which is the crystals of the edge there. And it'll light up when you hold it up to the light. That's one way you can tell the difference. 
And these are a couple. These are through hardened swords. Like the Running Dojo Pro 1060. However, while this was not sport of fake Hamon, these do. This is also 1060 steel, and it was marketed as a match of hero. It's actually made by a company called Jin Long Sword Company. And they actually made a decent little sword here for 60 bucks, but still a lot of problems. Or I think it was 80 to 100 bucks. It went on eBay. They were all surplus. For some reason they never got sold normally. But it has through hardened and a fake Hamon etched on. And you can see the Hamon etched on there. Now, this is an older model Ronin Dojo Katana 1045 steel. And the older Ronin Katana had Hamon, fake Hamon on it. And these were wire brushed, which is using an abrasive to create a different pattern along the edge. And you can see the difference of the wire brush I'm on. So let's talk a little bit about through hardening versus differential hardening. Why are these Ronin Katana through hardened rather than differentially hardened like they were in the old days? Well, at the same time the Japanese were making swords using differential hardening, in Japan, the Europeans were making wonderful swords as well, using through hardening techniques and spring tempers. They had a little pure steel, better iron in Europe, and they didn't have to develop the techniques the Japanese had to develop with their swords. So the Europeans were doing was through hardening their steel, no clay application, resulting in a nice flexible blade. You see the flex in that blade. This is an Albion Squire. It's an American-made reproduction European sword. Now this sword has this Euro-style European tempering. What they would do is through harden the blade, usually by quenching it at all, getting it hot after it being shaped and forged, and quenching it all or interrupt the quench in a medium, and bring it up to a high hardness of 57, 60, 62 Rockwells, which is a measure of hardness, and then temper it by heating it slowly, bringing it up in temperature, and letting it slowly rest at temperature, which brings the hardness down. And then that results in what's called a spring temper, which is a nice flexible sword that returns to true, and it's still hard enough to hold a good edge. This was the European answer. Again, the Japanese were dictated by the materials they used, where the Europeans did this. Well, today, with our pure homogeneous steels, we don't have to use differential hardening if we don't want to. It is still good for training purposes. Um, it's good for a traditional Japanese sword. However, something like the Ronin Dojo Pro line are de dedicated heavy cutters for someone who wants to do a lot of test cutting in the dojo. It may not necessarily be at a high skill level yet, doesn't want to risk a very, very expensive differentially hardened sword. Maybe somebody wants to do backyard cutting. This is a nice, and it doesn't bend a uh, European sword because geometry makes it very stiff. So this is but this is a nice through hardened sword, which still makes it very good, nice and hard enough on the edge to hold a good edge, but it's much springier and prone to not bending, that's the difference between hard and sword wood. So it makes it a good choice for today's cutter who wants a tougher sword. Let's talk about steel types for one second. We talked about Tamahogany and its varying carbon types. Carbon is what makes steel hard. So when we talk about steels, we're talking about 1045, 1060, 1960, 5160, 1095. You hear a lot about through hard 1095 swords coming out of China. I don't think they make any through hard 1095 swords in China. There's a lot of misinformation. Uh, I'm not even sure a through hard 1095 sword would be a good idea because 1095 gets very brittle when hardened. It's got a lot of carbon, it gets very hard, and becomes brittle. A good 
steel. The, the, the first, go back, step back a little bit. The first numbers in steel, like say 1050, 1060, 1045, the 10 is a series of steel. Steel is an alloy of iron. And they alloy this with different metals. Now, I'm not a metallurgist. I am not an expert. I don't. I'm just giving you a very brief overview here. Tin is a series of the steel. It talks about the different uh, alloying compounds that are in the in the iron with the steel. And when you get different series of steels, like say 9260, you're getting a steel that has more silicon in it, which supposedly adds the flexibility. Uh, when you get something like 5160, that's also again a different series of steel and I don't know what's added to 5160 off the top of my head. Maybe manganese is supposedly good for shock absorbance. So these are specialty steels. But to make a really good tough sword, all we really need is a good spring steel. Uh, a medium carbon steel like 1050, 1060, 1070 steel. And you get 1050, 1060, 1070 steel with that carbon content and you can harden a blade acceptably to take a good edge to meet a good spring temper where it'll be a nice tough sword. And so that's what we're looking at with our Ronin Dojo Pro Katana. We've got a nice good tough 1060 blade. Through hardened, very tough, very sharp. Now let's talk a minute about why we see some 1060 blades on the market that are 80 bucks, 60 bucks, 50 bucks. Well, the steel doesn't really matter. I know I just said it did, and it does. But what matters as much as the steel or anything else is the heat treat. And the heat treat is what we're talking about when we talk about differential hardening, through hardening, tempering, quenching, all that's the heat treatment. Without a good heat treatment, the steel's garbage. The sword's garbage. So a lot of these swords you see that are so cheap have poor or no heat treatment at all. They'll bend, they won't hold an edge, they're not a viable weapon. Another thing is the way the sword is built. I want you to take a look at this cheap Masahiro bamboo here. Okay? Shoelace Sagio, as compared to the Ron Dojo Pro with this nice chemical fiber Sagio. We don't see the horn, buffalo horn elements in the fittings on the Saya. We have zinc alloy or some form of copper alloy fittings as opposed to the black and iron that we see on the Dojo Pro. We got this shoelace Suka Ito that does not alternate wrapped incorrectly on the non tapered, non ergonomically shaped handle. We look at the Suka here. We got a nice silk Suka Ito, a nice tapering ergonomically shaped Suka again here. We have channels for the Samagawa strips, which we don't see here. This is the difference between an $80 to $100 sword and a $250, $300 sword. It's attention to details, and these are the things you're going to need. These are the t this is the attention to details you're going to need to have a nice, good, user-friendly, tough, well-put-together sword that's going to take the shock of, being, of cutting again and again and again and not fail on you. I'm sorry I was a little long-winded today, and I promise the rain will let up soon, and we're going to get out and really mess up one of these swords. First test I'm going to do is I'm going to test 1045 Ronin Dojo Katana. Because you hear a lot about 1045 steel being the least, the minimally acceptable steel for a sword and being soft and edge rolling and stuff like that. Well, I know for a fact some of, the, some of the toughest swords that you can buy are 1050 through hardened spring tempered swords. So I wonder, 1045, is it really that? bad. So that's what we're going to find out. Our first test is going to be against 1045. Still sore. We're going to take it up through varying degrees of bamboo. Uh, the bamboo is bigger around as my arm. Then we're going to cut some plastic balls with it to see how the edge held up. And then we're going to go add another blade with it. Mm, some steel, some sort of metal. And eventually we'll get to a hammer if we make it that far. And we'll break that thing to pieces. And we'll see how well it holds up. So that's coming up next. Stay tuned. Thanks for bearing with me on my long-winded rant today.